Hello, and welcome back to Dial H for Hero Clicks. I'm your sexy ranch and co host, Calderness. We have an incredibly special episode for you guys this week. We have special guest, Anthony Barnstable, official WizKids Hero Clicks judge. He judged at Worlds and incredibly fast man, all around cool dude. We also have Ian Eggleston in the studio, the Dial H producer, mostly on YouTube. He's joining us because you could not give up a chance to talk with uh, the old Barnstable here. So it's episode 434. Howdy, howdy, let's get rowdy. So if you're looking for emotional satisfaction, my advice to you is seek professional hero clicks. No. Are you serious? Again? How many people even play this game? Like the hundred? Instant deadpan humor. Oh, how do Six yeah. people yeah. think I am funny. It's the hard day's work. Not that you know anything about that. Which absolute fools. It's not richer nonsense. I'm gonna make hero clicks like that forever. Are you kidding me? Okay, Google, the back symbol. Let's attack him because he's a jerk. Wow, wow, wow. Dial H for Hero Clicks is brought to you by CoolStuffInc.com, where you can find cool stuff in stock every day, including all the latest Hero Clicks singles and sealed products. Make sure you check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Use code DIAL5, that's D I A L 5, 5% off your Cool Stuff Inc. order. Like always, is Simeon Bruce. What's going on, Simeon? Yo, that is me. I thought you forgot about me for a second, not going to lie. Oh, I wouldn't have done that. That would have been horrible. You're always here and always show up on time. I, employee of the month, year, decade, years, everything. Nah, wouldn't have, wouldn't have done that. Next up in line, though, we have Ian Eggleston. What's going on, Ian? Well, not too much. I uh, just got back from Brookings from like a big football game this weekend. So had a solid weekend. Okay. Excited to do the show. On. And last, certainly not least, the person I'm excited to talk to and finally have on the podcast, we have Anthony Barnstable. What's up, Anthony? Having a great day here. Excited to be on. This is the first podcast interview I have ever been a part of. That's wild. Oh. To me. It's wild to me that in all these years of all like the memes and everyone like all around, I'll say love Anthony. You know, there's a lot of hero clicks love for you. It's wild to me that nobody's had you on the podcast before. Well, I'm glad I, we. Had. I appreciate you having me on, then. And we are so excited to have you on. I'm glad we finally did it. I believe it's taken this long. We did it, ladies and gentlemen. So, Anthony, for all the people at home, if you want to get into a little bit about yourself, I think most people know who Anthony Barnstable is, though. I mean, if you've seen a Dial H impressions video, you know, slash around the hero clicks sphere you know but anthony why don't you just give us a little background like when did you start playing hero clicks and what set was released at the time and then when did you make the transition into like judging and stuff so this is your like, hero clicks origin story if you would yeah so i started playing hero clicks back in 2005 uh with a marquee event the equivalent of modern day release events for the fantastic forces set amazing sculpts definitely a great set to get started with and that year went to gen con as my first big event to play in had a great time and fell in love with the game and have been playing ever since then uh about 2014 was uh at gen con again was the first time i uh was judge at one of the big whiz kids events and I fell in love with it from the first day of judging and have never turned back since then. Every opportunity I have gotten that I could uh, judge at one of those big events, I've chosen to take it and been thrilled to get to do it. And I hope I get to continue to do it. I have i don't remember when I first started getting a part of the community online. Um, it took me a good long while before any of my locals ever told me about HC Realms. And I learned about that site back in the day when that one was huge. And more recently, Facebook has been a great resource for staying in and talking to the community and learning about all the wonderful things that everybody has going on, the great events that people are organizing. But yeah, that's a little bit of, of my background. Ooh, what a cruel to de- prank than <laughs> telling you about HC Realms. Man, it's just cruel. <laughs> tell him about it or should not tell him about it for so long? Well, the fu- both. Oh gosh! <laughs> um, after the Sinister set pre-released, I got really hardcore into the game around that time, and I wanted to prepare for the marquee event, the release event of the Sinister set. So I had to manually enter in every single Hero Clicks 
that into a, an Excel spreadsheet from that set to study it and prepare and get ready. And then even like brought my printout with to show off, like, look how proud I am of all the hard work I put into oh, this. No, oh. and they were just like, you could have gone to this website. <laughs> And that was around the time that they started hinting that there might be some sort of really good resource I could find, but they still didn't tell it to me for like another... Uh, what? Wow. Why? <laughs> they <That's>, thought... Yeah. <laughs> I just really like to see a homeboy out here struggle. Wow. Oh my goodness. This is... Okay. <laughs> I don't even know if I want you to shout out your local venue where you started playing now oh. that I know who plays there. But if you want to, feel free to tell us where you started playing at. Um, I started in Grove, Illinois at a store that's no longer in business called Hero Clicks Head... Or, I'm sorry, um, Hero Head... <laughs> okay, that was funny. Like, okay, Hero Clicks Head... head uh, Hero Headquarters, man, you got me saying it. Uh, shout out to Lucas Land Landis there. So... To take it back a little bit, what was your favorite figure in the Fantastic Forces set? Or favorite the, team that you had built? Uh, Fantastic uh, Forces. The veteran Hawkeye on that Sky Cycle was oh, so yeah, is awesome. I love I love the way it looks. But, uh, I just so, want to start judging. I don't know if this is jumping way too far ahead. Um, how does one become a official like WizKids Hero Clicks judge? What was the process for that in back in oldie days of 2014? <laughs> so for me it was uh it was around the time that the oranges of hc realms the old school rules team changed hands from um harpua and quebster and normal view over to christos mill and rp gambit and Mr. Id and Necromagus, that was the time where I recognized, okay, sometimes there are changes in who are the judges and who are the people that everybody turns to. And that was when I set out the goal for myself of someday I want to be like that. I want to be one of those guys that people can go to to find out more about the game, learn from the game about, and get the information that they need to be the level of player that they want to be and know how everything works. And so I just went ahead and watched the rules forum posts on HC realms, which would be equivalent to nowadays watching like Facebook posts of people asking questions. And as soon as I saw them being posted, start thinking through what's the right answer to this question, start answering the question. And if other people have already jumped in voice, either that I agree with them to give more voices there or, a different opinion so that way we're talking about it more and really thinking through critically if that's the right answer um, and just being as involved as I could and being very um, passionate about everything I was doing to try and be part of the community and help out in the way that I knew how to. I also will admit I very hard tried to be a squeaky wheel that would not let issues go when I saw there was a problem could be addressed and i tried to do everything in my power to make sure it was acknowledged it was known and it could start being fixed and i think that might have been something not everybody loved as much as they could have but yeah around 2014 i i don't remember how he got my number but i just received a call from uh necromancy i'm brian rupp and he had asked me over the phone like hey uh, we need another judge for Gen Con. Would you be interested in helping out? And we had a bit of a phone call about a bit of a length of time on the call talking about it. And uh, I ultimately decided, you know, sure, I'll give it a try. I was very nervous. Like, this is going to eat up all my time at Gen Con. How am I going to have any time to have fun and enjoy myself at the con? And then I found out that's exactly how I'm going to do it by being a judge and loving every moment of that. And it was a blast. And I was so grateful that he offered me that. And I definitely heard that um, it, it was not the easiest decision for him to make because he was not everyone was thrilled with how much of a squeaky wheel I was at times. But as as Booster Gold says, squeaky wheel gets the grease, skeets, squeaky wheel. <laughs> right on. It's important, though, in a game like this where players are already trying to figure out, like most players broken way to play a piece how do we abuse it how do we find 
what interacts with this or that. You no, know? and I think trying to nail down every possible like interaction or like rules question people could have is pretty important though, especially in a judge looking at a, a figure uh, more so like a uh, puzzle to be solved. Yeah, I think is is very important. You know, I definitely and- agree. It's fantastic if players can go that extra mile to make sure um, that the community is aware when something should be addressed or there's a point of um, confusion in the community. Uh, because I I know I would feel absolutely heartbroken and devastated if I were a player and I showed up to a big event with a team that I was planning on playing. And in round one, the judge comes over and is like, oh yeah, no, you completely misunderstood that. That's not how that piece works at all. It doesn't do anything close to what you want you want it to do. And it's basically, you're just going to lose for the rest of the day. So I don't want any player to ever come to an event and have that surprise dropped on them just because there was something that was worded in a way that led to some confusion. Sometimes it happens because of language barrier issues. I know we have players internationally traveling And sometimes when English isn't your first language, it can definitely be a challenge, Um, especially when you're trying to parse the difference between how English semantics and Heroclix semantics works at times. Um, And I I just want everything to be as clear as possible. So basically everyone can walk into that room and everybody say, I know exactly the answer to that question that's going to come up with this figure. It's basically not even a question. It's just playing the figure and taking actions, and we know how it's going to work. Nice. It's a custom deja vu, Simeon, showing up to a tournament and then finding out a figure that worked <laughs> one way <laughs> doesn't I at say, all. I feel like that's more deja vu for you, isn't it? Like, it is, yeah, it is more deja vu for me. The yeah, Aries, yeah, uh, Wingard, yeah. So. No, but speaking of that, uh, have you ever had to make one of those like tough calls where you just like, I mean, obviously it's not really a tough call. It's like right or wrong. Like there's a clear cut line when it comes to rules in most cases, but have you ever had a time where you had to just ruin someone's day because they wanted to like something to work one way and you just like had to say no. And Oh, absolutely. Um, I remember there was, and there were several that have come up over the years and it has sucked every single time. The earliest one I remember was, Back when the power plant was around and the matter rearranger ring and somebody was matter rearranging the undestroyable blocking terrain of a map uh, and then phasing and going and hiding inside of it. Or I forget if they like uh, made a line to get in and then closed the line behind them with the matter rearranger and somebody had like a juggernaut that could destroy blocking as they moved through it and wanted to just charge in there next to him and end next to him to attack. And I was like, sorry, you can't end on the blocking. That sucks. And you just have to sit there while he hides and there's nothing you can do about it because you don't have any of the couple of resources necessary. Um, I remember there was one that came up with first turn immunity. And I don't remember what piece it was, but it was, I remember it was something with a Thanos um like the prime thinosi that did something with improved targeting and just messed people up with first turn immunity where they were oh right that it was like they were expecting to still be able to use their improved targeting during their first turn but he still shut it off and so then they just couldn't target him and ended up never being able to take a shot that game and then just got crushed by him i remember there was a question that came up with Scarab in terms of targeting a character in stealth that's holding an object sitting on hindering terrain and whether or not he could and that he cannot. And so there have just been a handful that have come up over the times and it's sucked every time to have to answer those. And it's like if if they would have known ahead of time, it might have changed what they brought or things like that. I don't know. Speaking of uh, first turn immunity, we do have a question for you in our Discord. Um, oh, this is more of like a joke question because of something that happened. Uh, but Bill asks if my opponent breaks first turn immunity, but I haven't left my own starting area, so they still have their first turn immunity. If I use pulse wave on him, will I damage my own figures as well? 
I can uh, break down the, the situation a little bit better if you want. Uh, so this was during a battle royal. Yeah, was, I'm, they came to the starting area? Yeah, so I I ran over to Bill's starting area before he took his first turn. So like I went and then he went. And so I was sitting in his starting area and he had party Thor. And so he just pulse waved my team. And I was like, I think that your whole team is still technically immune or still has like first turn immunity because none of them had left the starting area. So, right. And yeah, you were right that they did. Um, so your team is safe and his team is in danger or his one figure. Yeah, it was a bad call on my part for sure. I uh, was a little too overzealous with that move, but that was Sometimes. that was a fun one. I did want to ask because you get such a kick out of judging and hero click stuff. Is that something that's like always been part of like your like your I'll say real life, like your non hero clicks life? Are you kind of like a rules arbiter? Do you really like getting to the bottom of things like that in like all aspects, or is it just like something special about hero clicks? Uh, I mean my. Day job is as a veterinarian, so on a regular basis, I see situations where somebody comes in basically asking questions, not knowing how something works, and I have to explain it and break it down to them so the they understand kind of what's going on, look through kind of all the facts of the situation to understand it. So I guess kind of in a way, um, kind of when I was thinking about vet school, because it is uh, like something that you have to apply for and get accepted into. I was thinking at the time, like, well, if that doesn't work out, my backup would probably be lawyer because I really do like rules and that type of thing. Um, I do always enjoy talking to Adam Friedman. Uh, he is one of my closest friends and uh, he is a by practice. So I love listening to him explain to me the intricacies of how various laws work and interact with each other and the situations they result in in the real world so i would definitely say that that's something i enjoy in kind of my everyday life in other board games i play i will almost always manage to find at least one question that's like well we're gonna have to go consult board game geek or reddit or wherever and find out what the answer is to this complicated situation that just not the most irritating thing it always irks me where i've like played a new board game or something that i've gotten and maybe i don't fully understand the rules or my family doesn't or my friends don't we we get to this point where i'm like you know i don't know how that would interact uh i don't know what they were going for and it's to me very frustrating because it's shoot it's cool it's a cool idea chad i don't think you can do it though or it seems like you should be able to do it but i have no idea um, and if you can't find like a, a rule or like a ruling to that, do you just like our house rules come into play or? Yeah. And it always just feels like, well, either we're going to do it his way and then she's going to be upset or we're going to do it her way and he's going to be upset. And there's no real good like solution because there's no way to say who's right or wrong. Yeah. That's at least the Big good thing about hero flicks is we have decades of history a lot of these rules which can at least help us uh, or at least we have official people like you to give us a ruling <laughs> which is so nice this is, taking uh, a step back as a player anthony what was the uh, most successful that you ever did in a major event and what like era was it in what team were you playing like you had mentioned uh, fantastic forces when you started um what were some of your most successful runs as a player like when you were attending gen con uh, well, back in the day, um, there was at least twice in person that I won fellowship, and I was really proud of that and really happy that my contribution to that event was just making it a positive experience for as many people as I could and being positive and having a great time while doing it. Um, that was definitely something I was proud of. In terms of best run, it would have been, I believe it was top 16 I never quite managed to break that. And if I remember correctly, that one was, what year was that? I want to say like 2010, 2011. It was when the first carded sets had just become legal uh, at a major event. Uh, so like Legion of Superheroes and Avengers set. I don't remember if Justice League was legal yet or not. And I was playing 
a wild card abuse team with rookie Mon L from Origin set. Oh, he was awesome. Yeah, and then a suite of uh, chases from the Origin set as well. The Lois Lane, the Alfred Pennyworth, and I don't remember what other wild card abuse was there. Loaded him up with feats like nano armor and protected and various stuff running around with special objects. And I re- I remember two games that were frustrating, and I don't remember which one was the one that knocked me out, but I remember one where I rolled my dice and it landed directly on top of like his dial top, very flat, and it would have been a critical hit, but then like my opponent was like, that dice cocked and called over the judge, and they had me re-roll it, and then it was... I forget if I missed or just made it a regular hit. And it was like, eh, whatever. But then the other one was a ruling about how nano armor worked unexpectedly uh, that caught me off guard. And I think that was the one that had knocked me out that round. But that was the best I ever did. I never made it too far as a player, in all honesty. I am by no means one of the greatest players of the game. I just enjoy playing. Sure. That's to me, just uh, cut out the and by no means, and we officially have audio of Anthony saying, I am the greatest player. <laughs> oh, that's this is all just a trick to get more uh, audio from him. Fair that's enough. Absolutely perfect. Um, uh, did you just pumped once like cards came out and figures got more complicated? You were like, oh, baby. Yes, the more complicated we make this game, that's the money right there. Were you, were you super excited once they started adding like special powers and and whatnot well see i started back with fantastic forces so by that point in time fee cards were already around and fee cards already filled the role of adding the complexity to the game that um i think i might have originally found missing if i would have started sooner i don't know yeah. that i would have game as much if i would have started before uh say legacy but yeah special powers in the early days they weren't actually as complicated as feats the early special powers were a lot of like this character can use in-cap and telekinesis both on the same dial. <laughs> what? Whoa! <laughs> My favorites are like when they gave them something like charge as their attack power because they right. already had a speed power. I believe that there was, was a strange. Hawkeye from Avengers that got smoke cloud as a defense power. Yeah. yeah. And were it was like, okay, okay. So... Maybe to try this question again, let's say with the introduction of, say, like, resources, um, or, like, when resources really started getting going, where it was, like, into the era past, uh, like, past Book of the Skull and the Gauntlet, but then you get more complicated ones, uh, where it's, like, the seven deadly sins for both those resources kind of funky, uh, the force was funky to some people, a lot of people couldn't figure that one out for a while, uh, batteries, etc. How'd you feel about resources overall? Oh, I had a blast with them. I remember the power plant, the Mandarin ring power plant was my absolute favorite resource of all time. That one was so much fun. Um, The utility belt was crazy fun because of the rules interactions it could bring up. And I still remember some weird ones that like it took the community probably like a year or a year and a half before they even understood some of the cool shenanigans you could do with the the utility belts. Um, a lot of people, they felt the best clicks of the utility belt were the plus two stats and a power. I felt the best clicks of the uh, utility belts were when you got to use two different utility belt items and got to keep one of them. And I actually had some opponents, when I would play the utility belt, they would be like, oh, thank God, he's only on plus two in Flurry. That's way less scary now. <laughs> wow. And so yeah, those was, plus two flurry clicks. Oh man, yeah, there were whole metas defined around that. Yes, um, but there were also some really crazy, fun shenanigans with like brother voodoo and handcuffs and locking people down, um, and the grapple gun to cross the map in great distances really quickly. Yeah, those two resources were a lot of fun. The power batteries with all the different colors were so much fun. Orange is easily my favorite i'm a big fan of the orange lanterns all one of them uh, was that so that was i think Timmy and ian had talked about this on our road trip back from memphis but uh my favorite era to play in was the uh after trinity war was released but like that 2015 avengers assembles legal 
War of the Realms is War of the Realms. Excuse me. Uh, Flight is legal. That was like my favorite era to play in because you could make any figure good, in my opinion, if you slap an entity and give a battery and like all this other shenanigans to it. Um, where we were seeing like uh, the Ellie Guy Gardner finished in a top four in one tournament. I always remember, and I'm just like, he's got a 17 defense to start. How the heck did he win? You know, um, have a favorite era of Hero Clicks as far as either playing or crazy rule shenanigans? Ah, uh, a favorite era from kind of any of those standpoints it's tough to choose i hero clicks has just been so much fun ever since i have started playing and i have loved all of its various periods of time it's gone through so many different um eras that are all unique and it's i don't know that i could choose between one yeah that's really really tough uh, yeah. i did right. Those were neat. It was a fun time when we were. It felt like we were discovering the game again. Well, just from judging, you said your first like official uh, event was like Gen Con twenty fourteen. Uh, just from that period to now, we've had several huge rule shakeups. What was was there like a better time than now? I guess uh, for as far as like rules go and like the ease of understanding them. I mean. It's tough to come from the perspective of somebody who already knows the rules as as I do. Um, and I feel that I, I don't have the greatest perspective of what it looks like for a new player learning the game just because I already have that bias going into it. But I assume that the rules are getting easier to learn for somebody entering the game. At least I really hope that they are. And that's where I want the game to head, where some of those barriers to entry can be lowered and made easier and more accessible. Because, I mean, we have to keep the game growing. We have to keep new people coming in. And I still love the game having complexity and depth for the people that have been around for a while and want that. But the the core game itself, I feel, being simple and accessible is important too. That makes sense, yeah. Did you ever have, like... Is there, again, back to different eras of hero clicks? did you like one uh, more than the other as far as, like, judging goes and not necessarily, like, play, but, like, did you like the complexity of, like, the resource kind of stuff and miss that? Is that something that you'd like to see come back? I mean, I definitely liked the complexity. I always have the absolute best time the more judge questions I get and the more questions I get to answer. Um, this past world, I felt I got plenty of opportunities to run all around the room and answer questions and i was happy with that um so i can definitely say i'm currently happy with where things are at in terms of what i get to do and how i get to stay busy doing it when i'm at those big events having a blast um i can't really say that it was necessarily better when there were resources that i was getting more questions um just that they were different questions because we're still we're still always having questions that come up. The win is there for a reason and has great questions being asked to it and on it. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel that it was necessarily better with resources, just different. So if you didn't have like a favorite era to play in, uh, you had mentioned that you'd like uh, the Orange Lantern battery. Was there a favorite month-to-month event that you had throughout like the course of Hero Clicks? Oh, like storyline, organized play, monthly event? Yeah. Oh, oh, man. Um, those were definitely a lot of fun. I I definitely went the hardest on the War of Light storyline organized play event series. I went to multiple different venues for that. I found one venue where I ended up being the only person who showed up to it. Oh, no. And, oh. <laughs> no, that was I was fine with that because uh, I just called up adam who lived close by and asked him like hey adam you want to drive over and then i asked them like hey if we pay an event fee that is equal to the cost of the kit could we just sit here and play all day long and open a whole case and they were like well we are not losing money by doing this and we're still getting to run the events and people are enjoying it sure why not and so we had a blast that day and it was so much fun we would just like one round each open up two boosters and then the next round each open up two boosters and just keep going through until we got through it all and then like went back and build some teams between what we had pulled throughout the day. It, it was a good time. 
Uh, and there were so many fun sealed events with War of Light and fun constructed events, too, with War of Light. Um, some venues chose to do it that way, and that was a perfectly fine variant. I love that WizKids gave stores that option to do things whatever way worked best for them and made the most sense for their local community because it led to so many great unique opportunities that I wouldn't have had if it was all just highly structured Friday night magic. I, I love that. That's like a dream come true. It's like, oh man, oh, just me and my buddy, we just spent all day playing with like all the war lights. It just seems like so awesome to hear those players dream to do that. <laughs> Sounds great. It felt yeah. like video but getting to do it in person before those were popular yeah like the uh the structure that you guys played with war of light that is oftentimes uh how i go about playing with my cases like i'll pick up a case and then typically we'll open it in a fashion where it's like i'll take two packs you take two packs play with what we get and we'll kind of work our way through all of the new figures we just got so that with War of Light, oh my gosh, yeah, that would be a dream come true. That'd be amazing. I have a favorite figure in War of Light for uh, month one slash month, I guess not month one month, but whatever. <laughs> the the odds and even numbers that it was split up into, the uh, halves of bricks. Did you have like a first half War of Light favorite and a second half War of Light favorite who like when you pulled him or him or her or whatever, you're like, oh yeah, it's going to be a good day. Well, I mean, wave one, it was if you pulled that weapon or cord, you were always in a fantastic place and going to do... Okay really well in that event um so that one was the easy choice but for in terms of the entities when you pulled one of the entities i definitely always thought ophidian was the most fun to get to use um i felt he had some cool powers that when you get to break those out on a character they're really neat in sealed you even get to often play them as their higher point line which you almost never get to see them on the map. So it was it's really fun to just get to see them on the map at first, doing all their stuff before um, they would be KO'd and then reassign. Nice. So when you pulled an entity, it was usually instantly like, oh yeah, I've just made rent this month at that time. It was like insane for how much entities were. I uh, I, I never had the, the fortune of playing one. So it's always cool when people talk about like, oh yeah, dude, you actually am on the board because as soon as War of Light was over, it felt like you never or instantly sidelined like ever, <laughs> and always like never played on board ever again awesome I have a another like mini type rules question who if you can think of it uh your biggest repeat offender uh, a figure that has caused oh i thought you meant play rules oh no 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 it's like yeah, getting name names. cheating not, we're not getting into our yeah we need a list just yet. we need names uh, no like repeat offender being a hero clicks figure that well, Got a ton of rules. You were always asked, you know, whether it be, I won't even name any examples because people will laugh at me. Um, but yeah, who might be uh, a hero clicks figure in your history that it's like you always felt like you're getting rules questions for this figure? Uh, well, I definitely remember when a WizKids exclusive Felix Faust first came. <laughs> His book long card was a Full of rules questions and they continued to pop up for almost two years he never got any simpler in terms of rules questions and it was pretty fair uh what did you think of i guess the off felix fast a little bit he was one of the i think the only figure in hero Hooks history to get early rotated he wasn't banned they never they never they had, i don't think they've ever banned a figure up until that point said he just got early rotated what were do you remember your thoughts about that at the time i do and uh since then i feel they've also grown over time as well i do remember at the time thinking wow he is the first like single figure call out to be early rotated like this but then i immediately thought back about has anything like this ever happened before and i remember web of spider-man was the only set i could remember and think of that only had one year where it was legal in constructed at worlds before being rotated out because it did have a second appearance at a big whiz kids official event where it was pre-released and because of that i think that played a role in why it might have been early rotated it could have been ben crawler um web of spider-man nightcrawler it could have been that it would have just been like 
two years and three quarters months old by the time it rotated if they waited an extra year who knows the exact reason but there was a second thing where it happened and that set had another figure that was very well known in the community like felix faust was not for his rules questions but for being competitively very powerful so it's something that i thought about and i was like well maybe this isn't truly the first time this has happened there kind of was that other time um but overall, I I feel it was healthy for the game. I think it was a good decision. And I was really surprised that Heroclix was willing to do that, uh, that WizKids was willing to do that. And I was wondering, would we ever see it happen again? And we have not seen it happen since then. So for better or worse, um, that's something that they reserve very, very heavily. And... Some people think banning things more often should be okay. Other people don't. I think it's something that makes Heroclix really unique. Okay, right on. To go along with that, um, despite, like, I was going to ask this, but Felix Faust does seem like the most obvious contender. Uh, is there a specific figure or element that you remember just thinking that they, like, really messed up with? Like, the design was just, like, not necessarily poorly designed, but, like, oh, they just, like, left this huge gap of possibilities that they were not like anticipating or something when they designed this figure or like a map element whatever kind of thing i know like one that the other than felix faust that comes to my mind is always titan's tower how like didn't get through play testing it didn't even get to be played it was banned before uh it ever like hit shelves i guess um because you could put that special terrain and block off like all access to the tower yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see where you're coming from with that. Uh, it was definitely something that was very powerful when that happened. I, the For me, the ones that stand out the most are some of the rock maps that that's happened with, where it's like, wow, this map just felt like there could have been a little bit more planning with it in terms of not needing it to end up getting banned. Um, those are definitely the ones that stand out the most to me as the ones I really remember. The classic example in terms of one made by WizKids was always Tiger Lily from Indie set that has two Uzis in her hand and a printed zero range and a full dial of Blades Claws Fang. And it, <laughs> there was clearly a misunderstanding between the person designing the sculpts and the person designing that dial. I always love those. I love like the the sword in one hand, like gun in the other, and it have like four range charge, or or like you said, zero range with two guns, like beautiful. In that That's same always... set, there was the veteran she who had two swords and eight range. So, hmm, <laughs> really well, balanced could... all things. It would hurt somebody if you throw it. If you just that throw it. True. What's that gonna do? That is tough. That's tough. I mean, I got nothing. Uh, one of my favorite sets that ever came out was the Captain America movie set, the Winter Soldier set. To that, they introduced ultra light and ultra heavy objects. How did you feel about those and then their weird rules? Remember them semi correctly. I do believe in ultra heavy, you had to have super strength, but also 100 points or more. And I guess this isn't the first time we'd seen ultra heavy. We did see the tanked. Yes. And the ultra light, forget the specific rules, but that was anyone could pick it up. Then could only throw it though. I don't totally remember. Um how did you feel about taking just the normal thing we've had since the the dawn of time objects and then taking them to extremes one way and the other? And then I think a year or two later, instantly not making any more of them. So yeah, I think that's a another fantastic question. I would say I was really happy to see WizKids continuing to try new things and try new directions and see what could improve the game and add more depth and variation. Um, that's always exciting when they try new things out and try to figure out how we can make the best game possible um, for everyone involved. And I really like anytime they take that risk. Because, I mean, it is a risk, and it's not always going to work out perfectly, and I'm going to assume that they were not 
uh, ultimately thrilled with how it could be used moving forward. And that's why they stopped doing it or something like that. At the time, I remember thinking it was really exciting and interesting that with that point cut off on the ultra heavies that a figure has to be 100 points or more to pick them up that there were several pieces where i would look at and be like no why is this figure only 95 points if only if more expensive for the exact same stats and i really like any sort of game design that can be done where it can make me look back at a piece and say i wish it were more expensive the problem is that it's bad because of its cost um and it's too expensive or like it's way too good for its cost. It's that it's bad because it's too cheap and I need it to be more points. That's, awesome. That's hilarious. I love that. I think there, there are some weird effects out there that are like point value specific where you're like, man, be so good one. If was more. yeah, that too. Exospecs is like one that I, I kind of want them to do with more objects where you have to have like qualifiers to let you use it. Like, Exospecs was they had to be at least 30 points um but yeah i always thought like with mjolnir and stuff like not necessarily like a keyword one but like we do have that going forward uh at least when the batman team upset drops we'll have like keyword related objects but yeah like something that this character has to already be fairly powerful to use this item like they can't just be a generic uh thug or whatever kind of dude Yeah, I think it's a really interesting area where they could do things both like that and then even just pick some of the powers that don't get enough love. Like, oh, you can only equip Mjolnir if you already have Smoke Cloud. And then it's like, no, why won't they just give my figure Smoke Cloud, the power that everybody always wants? (laughs) (laughs) That's how we make Smoke Cloud important. (laughs) Smoke Cloud to pick up Mjolnir. Oh, gosh. They kind of go the whole like rules change and stuff like that you i've noticed a trend and maybe this may be off base or not but like for the 2017 thor rules changes they were already giving a lot of characters that had mind control the ability to ignore the feedback damage from it and then post thor there was no more like mind control feedback uh, kind of same thing with wonder woman 80 if people were able everybody can pick up a light object now anyone can pick up a ultra light object or, you know, range combat expert, close combat expert, there were several figures that have existed since, I mean, way, way before War 80, but would let you use uh, RCE and CCE respectively as just a close or ranged action. I think uh, WizKids does that to kind of test out rules, see how they feel, and then can become major, like, actual changes for everything overall? Or is that maybe more of a uh, coincidence and not so much a, we make these special powers in a few years that's just how the power is going to work wow that's a really good insight i never really thought about that i as you say it i can definitely look back and notice the trend but yeah i just never really considered that maybe that was related and that there was a a correlation or a causation or anything like that behind it yeah i don't know i think it would be a cool way for them to test that out and decide that's a lower risk way to see if it could work well Um, And then they could continue to take those risks or it could even be a matter of like, they think, Hey, this could just be a really cool one time power or effect on one guy. And then they're like, you know, I like that one. Let's do it again. Or they just ultimately decide, you know, that went over so well, we never thought about doing it this way, but what if we do something more with it for everybody? I, I don't know how they exactly decide on doing that, but that might be how it goes about. I don't know. That's a really cool idea. I never thought of. Asked a good question. That that was my goal today was to ask one really good question to Anthony, and I've I've met it. I've met my quota. Happy. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Before the Everybody... show, we had uh, kind of talked like I had brought up uh, pin particles, like how that was kind of like a relic. It, I think it was technically a relic, but it didn't require the relic roll anymore, and then. Yeah, when they went forward, um, mostly like equipment stuff after that, you didn't have to do relic rolls for. And then they eventually just changed from relics to equipment. Um, yeah, I I think going forward, a lot of like the stuff that they've been like when we talked to Scott, um, they are taking like some cool chances with like different things. Uh, obviously, they got rid of ultra heavies, but there's a potential that 
things similar to ultra heavies will be able to be on like the board again with like the special terrain that can do x amount of damage potentially that kind of stuff i just think it's a really neat avenue that we're going down and i'm i'm excited to have my hypersonic super strength character someday in the future fly up and hit somebody for seven once again no he's never again seeing memories of that you where you're coming from i have missed that for a little bit of time want to because this is just too much fun uh bko's I haven't had him almost three years. <laughs> Minute. What do you feel about the qualifications and how WKOs were run? Do you think that's a good way to get qualified? Do you think there's a better way to get qualified? So, like traditionally, WKOs, if you got first place in WK, you got a, uh, I think, you mentioned in Nationals, I believe. It wasn't Worlds. Yeah, I think it was just Nationals. Um, how do you feel about like that? Do you think WKOs could be Worlds qualifiers uh, and then second takes home a Nationals qualifier? Or do you think. If we were to reinstate WKOs going forward, uh, just a game or like, what do you think? So, for one, I agree with that love of WizKids Opens. I would definitely love to see them return. I definitely understand that right now we are in unprecedented times, and thank you for your cooperation in these unprecedented times. But once things get back to the position where a lot of states all feel comfortable with that i i just don't know the whiz kids opens can really work in a system where some states are a lot more locked down than others and might not really allow for the opportunity for it to even be hosted in their state especially if it's a state that already had been hosting whiz kids opens in the past or if it's just one that maybe was right about to start hosting it who knows where they're going to add them um I, I feel once we get back to that point where a lot more places can have those decently sized in-person events, it would be something that would be amazing to see in person again, because I did not realize how much I was missing Worlds until that past weekend when I got to be there with everybody else, and it was such a good time, and I missed everybody so much and had a blast seeing them again. So more opportunities like that would be fantastic. I still don't think I've ever been to a WizKids Open in person. I don't remember one that was overly close to me at the time that it was happening because I've just been traveling around a bit. Uh, but I would love to get that opportunity to get to go to one in person and somehow be a part of it, even if it's just kind of watching what happens or whatever it ends up being when I'm part of it, if I'm part of it in the future. And I think the matter of how it should be used in terms of qualifying, I think the bigger part of that question has to be how should qualification for those big events like nationals and worlds work? I, I don't know that there's one right answer that's going to make everybody happy and make them be thrilled about it. I think it's kind of a matter of choosing what's going to make the most people happy. And I don't really know which qualification method makes the most people happy. I'm not sure if even the community really has a good answer on that one and knows. I think it's kind of one of those like Steve Jobs things where it's they have to figure it out and then they put it in place and then everybody's like, oh yeah, this was the one that we really wanted all along. We just didn't know that. Because there have been the times where it's like everybody can only qualify in person at the event, uh, like World's Weekend, and then others where everybody has to pre-qualify ahead of time. You cannot show up and just expect to get in. And then everywhere in between where some people qualify and some don't, and how far that qualification gets you, it's been all over the place. And I don't know what's best. So I don't have a good answer on that part. <laughs> was just because I know we had talked about uh, the grinders and everything at Worlds for the buy and just the attendance being like low for them and then just how many people already had a buy because of course there were still online tournaments and everything to give you points. I was just curious continuing that conversation but alright. I'm bummed that you've never been to a w WKO before. WizKids Opens are uh, what made me kind of fall in love with competitive play. Not that I'm super in love with competitive play but um, what made me always excited to go, whether it be a sealed or a uh, like 300 modern WKO, those have always been a blast. So I'm hopefully in the future, right in a year or two or whenever we can get back to having them, uh, you can make it out to some because they they are awesome. I always remember them just being, despite the fact like they're relatively like simple. They're kind of like testing grounds for new tech and like 
seeing yeah. if certain builds work. Like, yes, this figure's good, but is it good enough to win at a WKO? Is it good enough to win consistently? So you'll see people play like some kind of off the wall teams that they might not take to like nationals or worlds, um, but they still like try out like new stuff. So I've seen, yeah, more diverse fields at WKOs than anywhere else. Uh, speaking of like events in general, though, um, how much has since you started judging? How much have WizKid events changed? Like how much has Worlds changed? Nationals? Uh, I didn't go to a Worlds event until 2018 which was at pax unplugged but just in the the one time there and then immediately in memphis the next year there's a huge difference for me yeah i think um in some regards some stuff has stayed the same like the important stuff has stayed the same in terms of i mean we're still doing 300 modern uh generally one versus one matches um the the portion that people care about keeping the same is staying the same. But some of the big stuff in terms of like the venue that it's at has completely changed over to Memphis, Tennessee to a great venue at Graceland that has so much space for us to utilize and have a great time at as, as the podcasters showing off everything that's happening there, the judges getting to run around in great open space um, with nice aisles between players, players having, what I think are reasonably comfortable seats. I don't know. I've never heard anybody give their rating on the quality of the chair or the table. Um, Write that down, Ian. We're going to ask. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> I don't know how people think the food compares to the previous venues that it's been at. All these wonderful questions about the world's experience that nobody ever talks about. Um, but overall, yeah, I think it's changed in some wonderful ways that have definitely made me happy. In terms of kind of having a consistent venue where I I can plan on knowing it's going to be in Memphis, Tennessee, as opposed to like, oh, is it going to be a Gen Con this year? Is it going to be at Origins this year? Is it going to be a PAX Unplugged this year? I don't know where it's going. There's so many possibilities. Um, I do like that. I like that um, my weekends on some of those other conventions are opening up more to be able to do more other activities. Um, in the past, when I've gone for, when I went, for my first year at Gen Con, I went there exclusively to play Heroclix. That was the only game that I knew was going to be at Gen Con and 100% of the reason why I attended. And then I went and found out, whoa, they have other games at this place too? I should probably check some of those out. And it's a blast. All the new games that you see and get to experience and play. And now I still go back to Gen Con and I'm like, I'm looking forward to playing all these other games and I have more time to do them because Worlds isn't this weekend. It's Sometimes some hero clicks too, and I'll get to occupy my time with that too, but not always just hero clicks all the time. Well, speaking on the topic of worlds, was there a highlight of the event for you? Other than like seeing everybody, you know, just being back to it, was there anything specific that was just, you know, so nice about it or something that you just had particularly fun with? Maybe there was a new change that was great, anything like that? um for me honestly i just enjoyed i mean yeah there was so much that i enjoyed but something that i did a little bit differently was um outside of my time judging i spent more time after hours just talking with all the other wonderful people that were there um staff members volunteers um players podcasters random strangers that just also happened to be at Graceland that same weekend. Um, and I just had a great time getting uh, to socialize and engage outside of the game as well. Um, definitely had some great conversations. Um, I sat down and talked to the, with Howard for a little bit and he showed off um, some amazing tributes to his belated wife Tracy that he has made and put together and those are really wonderful to get to see I got to catch up with Easton who I haven't seen in I don't even remember how long and meet his new wife and congratulate him on his marriage um, I got to see so many people that I haven't seen in so long and check out Calder in his amazing um, the captain slash US agent cosplay that always looks phenomenal on him thank you we have a, we have a pretty fun upcoming sketch uh, starring old j-dubs there i'm excited for people to 
the uh, the upcoming Avengers fair. So that's going to be good. Continue with world's talk, though. If you wanted to enlighten some of the people at home that maybe heard murmurs of this stuff at Worlds, but there were some very interesting uh, rulings in 300 Modern, both with Mastermind and then uh, the Collector, uh, which later got clarified um, to not how people play them at all. Uh, is there anything you wanted to like expand upon that? With the... I mean, yeah. It, those were definitely both interesting to have come up. I... Honestly, never heard anyone bring up or ask about that collector question as far as I remember prior to that weekend. And it was one that, to me, was just obvious how it worked. Um, so the the question that came up is one that is now posted on the win. Um, but the question was the collector's damage bonus that he gives out. Does it apply to characters that later join the force, like through mastermind or through mind control or through uh, being generated like a bystander token is, um, do those also benefit from the collector's damage buff if you're playing him on your team? And uh, to me, that seemed like there was absolutely no question to it because his effect uh, following the rules acts basically like that old term burst where it has a triggering condition um, at the beginning of the game, or I mean, no, that wasn't the one that has the triggering condition. The other one does. Um, it it has a triggering condition of do you have all these different characters on your force that are from different sets, um, and then it resolves, uh, and it has a duration that it specifies, which is as long as collectors on the map. So it seemed really clear that it was going to work that way, like a an old school burst where. All the characters that are there at the start are the ones that get it, and nobody else is going to get it, um, regardless of when they show up, and regardless of if the characters are still from the same set or not. If you suddenly get two characters from the same set, the duration is still going to be in effect and still be going. So it was something that it was just like, it felt obvious to me, and nobody had ever brought up the question before. So to see so many people... Uh, all as a community agree it works the exact same way and for them to all agree it works the way that was contrary to what I was expecting them to say uh, just kind of came as a shock and like a blind side to me. I, I was very surprised that that happened and I really don't know how that happened, why nobody was really talking about this before, nobody was asking about this to make sure that the figure they wanted to play worked the way they thought it did, especially when it was something that so many players said was really critical to how their team functions. I mean, as a player, I would never want to go into a tournament and say, well, I really hope this figure works the way I want it to, or else I lose. So the yeah. fact that you would enter the tournament just hoping on that seems really risky. And uh, yeah, it was just one of those, I don't know where everybody got that idea from and where, like, why it was absolutely everybody. It, it, like, it was, no, though, yeah. It would have made more sense if there were, like, maybe 25-75 split or something, where at least some people thought it might work the other way. I think that's, that's kind of why uh, nobody had brought it up, though, is because everyone was just, like, we were all together in, like, a... Uh, being wrong about like, the, the wording on it or whatever um, but yeah as like a community everyone came together and just agreed for whatever reason that, like yeah that's how it works but, yeah, yeah i would just it's... really interested to hear like who were the people that kind of started that and why did they think that and like where did that idea come from for anyone who like thought it worked the other way why what was the rationale behind that i just don't know I'll we'll have to the, listen uh, back to our set review episode and see if we got it wrong. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we did. Can't imagine even us being the first ones to say it, but I can also see us uh, going along with maybe what everybody else also thought. Comes also to the fact that you're a veterinarian. The the horde mentality, not herd, horde, herd mentality almost that we had for uh, for collector was pretty impressive here, host players. Good job. I think everyone was so excited about it. I mean, the idea of giving bystanders plus one damage. The second I heard that, I was like, yeah, that's how it works, because I love that. <laughs> so, maybe some of that involved with it. Okay, maybe that's a fair enough reason that it's just, that's the 
more exciting way because it makes him do more things. I did not think about the interaction with mind control at all, though, where now they're friendly to your force. Now they get the damage boost. That was something that had not crossed my mind, like, very much at all. I found that out, like, very recently before Worlds. So when they started ruling on that, that one made a little more sense to me because I could see somebody not understanding that or not hearing about that ahead of time. But the bystander thing, I was definitely huge on from, like, the second it was being, uh, like, started talking about. So, yeah, I can understand how some questions came up for it. But, yeah, the whole ruling thing was just, it was bizarre for sure. So I would yeah. be interested to see how it started. Nobody called over a judge in regards to the bystander half of it. It was because of the mind control half of it. And it it only came up twice at two different matches. I I can't remember the names of the four players involved, but it was like in round three or something was the first time it came up. And then those players never asked that question again. It never came up for the rest of the tournament with those players. And then in the top 32 match, another situation where somebody mind controlled with collector and it came up a second time. And then that's where then it was like, wait, how does this affect the bystander half of this? And it was like, what do you mean the bystander half of this? It doesn't affect bystanders. And then people wanted to know a lot more about it and hear a lot more about it. Sure. We did speak with uh, Emily Rowett briefly. So shout out to the Queen of the North here. In a situation where she had a Thanos team with Collector going against another team with Thanos and Collector, and she mind controlled his Collector, so now she actually had plus two damage. And I believe they ruled that that was not incorrect either. Or that, that uh, yeah, that that was incorrect, excuse me. And uh, yeah, that was another situation where it's like, I hadn't even thought about that. Like having two Collector bonuses active at the same time, is that a legal thing? So yeah, Collector sounded like the nightmare of 2022, but uh, it seems like we got through it and we have a ruling on it now. So at least there's that. So the really fun part of that was the opposing collector is the one that's giving the plus one to the damage and the mind controlled character still is getting the plus one to damage. It's just not from the collector that I guess people were expecting. Oh, gotcha. Interesting. Plus two. Moral of the story need to ask more questions or they take something to a tournament the on a grand of scale of worlds is fun fun oh i love when the moral of the story is give me more things to do people asking questions more often i love that it's a good moral awesome anthony uh right in the tone it's what makes you run so fast what is the the speed force you into the barnstable force that gets you to the, to the table <laughs> so quickly well you see one day when i was at the lab i was mixing some chemicals and there was just this crazy lightning storm overhead that managed to come crashing through the roof and everything in the lab just broke around me and the next thing i knew i just woke up and i couldn't stop running um <laughs> but, <laughs> but Seriously, um, it came from when I was a player playing at Worlds, I would raise my hand all over a judge and like make eye contact with them, uh, say it loudly, and I would get somebody walking at what felt like the slowest, most just mind-numbing pace imaginable, like from the movies where you just want to strangle that person that could not possibly move slower character. And I didn't even know a person could move that slow. And I'm on the clock and you're not giving me more time on this clock. Uh, And so I just, the first day that I was judging, I was like, well, I know I would want my judge to get over there as fast as humanly possible or even inhumanly possible if they could. And so then I just said, yeah, that's how I'm going to do it. I love that so much. I love everything about that answer. That's awesome. The change you like uh, in the world a pedometer on you when you judge uh, i keep a pokemon go app <laughs> nice nice i was gonna say if you knew how many steps you took in like a weekend at worlds that'd be pretty crazy to like see what it ends up at um I'll- but going along with that how many calories do you think you burn slash 
do you have to like like the flash do you have to constantly be like munching on like protein bars or like how do you get through a full day <laughs> so funny story about that uh yes i do have to eat very well and stay hydrated and i learned that because I am very much not somebody who believes in the idea of burn the candle from both ends. I'm somebody who just throws the candle into the fire to burn it from every possible side all at once. Um, when I am passionate about something and I want to do it, I want to give every ounce of energy I possibly can to it and just burn it as hard as quickly as I can. And so when I first started judging, I was more interested in getting to do that judging and running around answering the questions and have a great time um and be as available to the players as i possibly could so i recognized i could do that more if i didn't pee and if i didn't drink and if i didn't eat <laughs> and it hurt. that was not the correct decision uh because then at the end of the day i would just kind of fall over and collapse and luckily on those first couple of times i did it uh, my loving partner and now wife, uh, Morgan would be there to help me not die and get me back to the room and get me some food and tell me that I should stop making terrible life choices. And I would tell her, no pitching that candle right back into the fire tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh no. You're like, Good the last weakness I must eliminate from myself is the human weakness. <laughs> <laughs> And it took me a good long while before I, I figured it out that it's like, oh, no, she has a really good point. If I eat and if I drink and if I take care of my body, then I can actually keep on doing this without dying. And then I get to do it more often, but I just have to take a couple of breaks here and there. So I have found if I eat a, a good, very filling lunch, not necessarily healthy by any means, but nice high calorie lunch. Uh, and drink water very, very regularly, uh, then I get to continue running around and have a great time. On the topic of food, um, because I love food and it's awesome, uh, and I'm glad you stopped being a robot who was diverting all function, all power to, <laughs> to judging. Um, do you have a breakfast of champions or a lunch of champions? I know I used to for a long time when I went to tournaments. Um, do you have like a favorite thing in the morning? Like, oh yeah, it's judging time. Time to go eat my breakfast burrito or something we do have a bit of a filming breakfast though typically when we get to filming we go to the taco john's down the street, john's get some breakfast burritos so that's i would say the dial h one of the yeah. time yeah. <laughs> Ian gets do you get a, a monster or a red bull or chase gets the red bull i'm i'm a red bull man i'm a red bull man, oh, man. simeon's the coffee guy and then i just get a, a different energy. i get a ghost energy or caffeinated we when we film but do you have a uh, go-to meal, uh, you know, breakfast of champions type of thing? Uh, I would say no, because, I mean, I'm usually traveling to an area that I don't live near for those types of events. Um, so for my breakfast, it's either going to be like if if the hotel I'm at has an included breakfast, whatever that is. Um, otherwise, whatever I can find that's open to get myself a breakfast. Um I started packing myself usually a couple of like Fruit Loops cereal bars for my breakfast if I can't find something because Fruit Loops are delicious and I'm pretty sure real F R O O T in them. Um, in terms, of, okay. no similar right. whatever I can find available at Graceland. It has been the delicious barbecue that they have at I don't even remember the name of that one. Um, but I usually go with that one because it's delicious. How do you make black and yellow look so good? <laughs> uh, it just, it goes well with my nice long hair flowing through the wind. Okay. So uh, what's the average Barnstable hair routine? Like that main Ooh, flow. That the fans are dying to know this one. Uh, so I use Pantene shampoo and separately Pantene conditioner. I do not recommend those men's 75-in-1 hair care products and everything else that they are. Um, and then, yeah, just washing it in terms of taking a shower is a great habit to get in. And then just a nice good comb through 
I also shower the night before, so I show up with dry hair because it's lighter, so I can move faster. Ooh, ooh, the like aerodynamic. Yeah. Have you ever asked right. uh, any WizKid employees if you're allowed to use like rollerblades to increase performance? <laughs> I am not nearly skilled and agile enough to move on rollerblade on a weekend like that. I will move faster with running. It's the same reason you don't see the flash on skates. Oh, true, true. Mm. Got us. He got us there. Anthony, is there anything you think we haven't added that you want to tell the people at home that's like a key to the Barnstable, the man, the myth, the legend? I mean, I just... I'm always looking for feedback on how I can continue to better do my part to be a positive influence in the community and make everyone's experience as enjoyable as I possibly can. So anyone who wants to share that with me, please do. And if you have it more constructive, the more I can do with it, the less constructive it is, the less I can do with it. And positive is just as helpful as negative because then I know to keep on doing the good stuff the same and not changing it, not taking too many risks. But yeah, please, just any feedback. I always love it. I'm trying to be the best I can for everybody and for myself. I love that. I want to get into the to the nitty gritty questions. Like, uh, have you ever caught a Heroclix player cheating or have you been called over for like stalling, etc. for years as a judge? Absolutely. That's definitely happened. Um, at the at the first Worlds I judged at, we had an episode where that happened in terms of... Um, I don't remember which one of us was the one that originally brought the issue up, but then it ended up need, needing to be talked among all of the judges and um, the event organizers about an episode of cheating that happened and how to resolve what happened. Um I know there there is usually at least one call of stalling that gets made per year uh, at whether it's at nationals or worlds or which or both or anything like that. Um, there's usually at least one per year that comes up, and there was one this year as well. And every time, those questions always suck the most, and they're the hardest because when you can't actually prove it, it's really just a he said, she said, and you're ultimately going to have to, somebody's going to walk away unsatisfied with the answer that happened. And somebody's going to walk away maybe very satisfied if you're lucky. Otherwise, both of them just end up leaving feeling awful with what happened. And that's no fun. It sucks. I, yeah. My biggest ask from the community is just try and not be the type of person that creates one of those questions in terms of being the person who it's called against and being put into a situation where either your integrity is being questioned or where a route, a decision is going to have to be made that one or both people involved are going to be really upset with it. And it's going to be a miserable experience. Cheating is always, I think above all else, a really awkward situation um, just sucks all around. Actually, uh, if it happens in hero clicks, like, really, man, I is hero clicks of all things. Come on. We don't, we don't need this. We were, no one does, but we, we definitely in the hero. We don't need it. Uh, not related, sort of related you guys looked over tarot cards, a fine tooth comb. How well do you think the system you guys had in place was for uh, making sure tarot cards could be played and were legal? And then if someone was doing some nefarious cheating with tarot cards, just merely getting rid of the deck. Uh, same thing with like the uh, giving you either sleeves or playing cards you could write on. What did you think about the whole system? Obviously, tarot cards are very new. This is the first ever major tournament and like the biggest tournament of the year. Using them, how did you feel about the system WizKids had in place for judges with all like the tarot card rulings, uh, with how you checked them, etc.? Yeah, so I was, for one, I was really happy that tarot cards were legal, that that uh, X of Swords main set got to be legal for Worlds, and we got to experience that together for the first time in terms of seeing what that looks like and how how it gets handled and everything. I was really happy about that. 
I feel that the system that WizKids chose and utilized worked really well because I did not hear a single question come up about somebody thinking their opponent was ever cheating with marked cards in any regard. Um, and every player that had a um, had to come up with some other solution about their cards because it looked like they could have been marked, whether it was intentionally or strictly just uh, damage that happened over time on the way to the event or straight out of the booster pack or whatever. It, that part, it doesn't matter. Everyone where it came up for, they were really understanding that, hey, I completely get why this call is being made. And they respected that decision and they wanted to figure out a solution with us to make sure that they were going to be able to continue to play and that there wasn't going to be that situation coming up where their opponents like, hey, I think he's marking cards. They didn't want that to happen. And I respected and appreciated that, uh, that they they did not want to add to that type of situation. There was a lot of positivity um, in terms of the community where somebody, hey, uh, my whatever of whatever card is the one that I need to switch out. Does anyone have one that I could borrow? And they managed to find somebody who could lend it to them, whether it was a friend or a stranger or whoever, or in a couple of situations, or they would even just run over to redact code really quickly that was there. Uh, and check to see if they could replace it right there by buying one from them. And they were more than happy to do that. And then in the situations where we weren't able to find something like that and sleeving it wasn't enough to hide the um, potential marking, they were really understanding and supportive of like, here, take these couple of playing cards and you're going to use those as proxies for your tarot cards that'll be off to the side. Every now and then there might be a little question of like, so where do I like, do I just keep my tarot deck out and visible to the opponent or what should I do with the actual cards? Um, and they were all super great and understanding about that and like, yeah, let's do it for sure. Um, so I really appreciated just everybody's understanding and cooperation and willingness to be a part of that. And I really loved that WizKids offered that chance uh, for players to use a proxy uh, instead of just having to say, like, well, it's slightly damaged, so it doesn't matter how it happened, you don't get to play it at all. I really think that was super kind and uh, respectful of WizKids to offer that to players. I know I didn't know about that uh, beforehand, that they would do something like that, and then when it was happening that day and i saw people that i was like that is really cool uh giving people that opportunity so awesome no i was really curious about your opinion about that just from a judge's perspective because this is such a new game element and a lot of people were worried about it and i'm glad that it uh went over as as well as it did especially with something like literally a month before worlds you know uh, so new and to involve shuffling cards people got really worried about like potential cheating potential whatever and i think the way WizKids handled it uh, was very well so you know especially since it's a a game elements that everyone wants to your majority of people want to use so like want to be able to play your, your game uh so yeah no that was really awesome i agree yeah <clears throat> i thought when when i saw that they were allowing to swap out whole decks with playing cards if one of the cards was damaged i was like ah that's a that's a smart move because i mean obviously like the backs of all the playing cards would be the same and then yeah it doesn't take away it would also like had they set the precedent uh, of needing like mint condition tarot cards that would have definitely like sent the secondary market into like some sort of like fervor where pristine cards were being sold at like top dollar and people it's were like now a, you... a pokemon market this is my grade <laughs> yeah my graded tarot cards here <laughs> yeah in slabs like <laughs> oh hey, no here's your 9.5 the tower <laughs> ready for tournament play <laughs> finally yeah it uh, was it was handled amazingly i mean i had made the joke that when everybody's build sheets were you know getting verified the tarot cards all that everything being sleeved it was i mean practically like the tsa in that first room there were so many lines of people and yeah they were really taking the time like shining lights on the cards you know doing everything they can to check that so that was definitely i think the biggest worry going into worlds and they handled it beautifully. So props to WizKids there. It was excellent. 
Another uh, aspect of like playability and uh, is on your force talked about earlier, I believe on a Facebook post, was if you have a broken figure or, or like a figure that is missing a hand, missing whatever, but you can still tell it's Spider-Man or something, they said like that would be legal. They pressed this year that they didn't want anyone not being able to play in Worlds uh, due to the fact of like a figure missing just any random thing. And then obviously the official tournament rules is that you can't mod a figure, right? But you can paint one. Um, and I don't know what it was, if it was a few years ago, where the justification was that if you modded a figure, it couldn't be, like, uh, overtly made it seem more powerful or something like that, I believe was maybe a sentence or, that was yeah, used a while ago. Try and make it look like a different character it, than what it is. Character, weaker, less powerful, more powerful. Uh, how do you feel about, like, that ruling or about the amount of times I've seen just Groot's ankles... Uh, being played against me, um, where then Broken Groot is like off, or like Mangog's like, f um, or even in some places, uh, people specifically break their Galactus uh, so they can see his dials better. I think that's like a solid way to do, like when figures are either broken or people want to break them, um, allowing them or allowing them to a degree. So. Overall, I definitely like the policy of allowing damaged figures because, I mean, I own Heroclix. I've owned Heroclix for, what is that, 17 years now? Some of them are not in the same condition they were when I opened them pristine, fresh out of the booster. Their CGA rating has gone down over <laughs> time. <laughs> so I definitely appreciate the idea that I could still play with those. Um because damage figures are still okay. Um, but I think it, it should also be to a degree. Like, I don't really like the idea of wanting to encourage people like, oh yeah, please go break your Galactus because that makes it so much easier for everybody uh, in terms of playing it and then you can travel with it easier. Like, I don't really like when it gets to that kind of extreme where you want to damage the figures because it improves things for everybody or for even some people involved. Um, I definitely agree with trying to avoid the mindset of we don't want it to get to the point as a community. We really don't want it to get to the point where like people are doing this with the intent of trying to mislead their opponents. Like it's one thing for Groot's Groot to be broken at the ankles because they're a little bit more fragile. It's another, if every single figure is shaved clean off the base, so now they all look exactly identical and it's hard to visually tell apart your hope summers from your jubilee or your thanos from any other figure like i i do think that there is a limit to it too um and i think that was kind of part of where that original modding rule came from of like they don't want you to take a batman that you're playing in the event and mod it to look like Captain America just because he's your favorite character. And then everybody sits across from you and they're like, oh, yes, Captain America, I remember his stats exactly. Oh, no, I made terrible decisions because you're playing Batman and you intentionally tried to mislead me by putting the wrong sculpt on it. Only done that once, uh, but thank you for bringing that up again. Um, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree <laughs> It does make me sad, though, that my uh, my new Calder Custom Batman Deep Cuts Torch is not tournament legal. Because it is know. modded. It does have a cape added to it. And Human Torch does straight up look shockingly like Batman. I was very surprised. We'll have to show you a picture, Anthony, the artist. Yeah, I'll get, them, I'll get them posted on the Facebook here. Uh, but they are beautiful. Line has been insanely fun. Have you have you seen any like really fun like painted deep cuts figures either at Worlds this past weekend or because I know we we saw some custom bystanders and all sorts of fun stuff. How do you feel about uh, I guess really to totally change I guess the question. How do you feel about uh, game elements like custom bystanders, three printed bystanders, where three you could use anything to represent them because I believe in the rules that'll even say maybe not I could be wrong. Uh, any action token, anything because there's not an actual physical WizKids product bystander for it. Do you feel about like uh, modding or using other figures for bystanders or whatever? 
No, some of them nowadays do have those kind of WizKids official, they make the bystander on the back of the uh, token that comes with that fast, that comes with that, not the Fast Forces pack, but the other pack that has the right, dice pack. pack. Um, some of those do have those, but I, I do support the idea of like use whatever um, represents it in a way that is not confusing to your opponent. Um, I really like that idea in terms of getting to see what creativity it leads to in the community and the great things we get as a result of it. Um, I think some players have been really excited about the different customs that other people have made. I know I've seen some people buying custom tokens, like buy standard tokens, because they loved how cool they looked. And I've seen some people using them as prizing in a fan tournament that they're running. And I think that's super cool to get to see um, that the community has found all of these accessories of their own that they want to build and make and create and use and enjoy. And I, I agree. I haven't seen as many um, painted deep cut cuts as I would like. I wish I saw more people um, painting and taking the time to customize those pieces and make them their own. I am not one of those people. I absolutely hate painting. Um, hey. I uh, playing Warhammer. I tried painting Necrons, which are like notoriously one of the easiest sets to paint imaginable. That was not why I chose them, um, but I learned that as I started them, and it was a miserable task that is just not for me. But I still like looking at the pretty painted ones when they. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Painting a big army is not fun to me. I once uh, had a game where it was I had to paint all these minions, and there was like thirty of them, and I was like, "Is." all the same sculpt and this is not fun no but painting like main characters to me fantastic for the x-men you know, cuts we have uh is super fun always a blast because you know it's only like you have like what 20 deep cuts 30 max something like that um not a crazy number i this is taking it way back to your hero clicks origins but while talking about tokens it made me think what did you use as action tokens when you first started out? I think nowadays most people gravitate toward the poker chip style action token because that is what you get from WizKids. Uh, but in the beginning, you used poker chips, knees, the the weird like uh, fish pebble things. Uh, people used all sorts of crazy stuff for action tokens. Was was the yeah. Anthony Barnstable action token when you started playing? I will point out nowadays WizKids does include in the starter set some cardboard little like hexagonal action token chips. I'm a big fan of those okay. uh, besides just the official poker chips that they also make. But back in the day when I first started, I originally used those weird fish pebbly beads that you were talking about. I always called them like Mancala beads. That was what I started with. Then uh, I transition from that over to those very very tiny little mini dice from wonderful whiz kids games like pirates um where you almost need a magnifying glass to read them i have a set of those and i would go through the effort of changing it from the one pip to the two pip oh, and oh my goodness yeah they're like so small you could almost like blow and knock them <laughs> off the table I think I still generally would put two of them on there, but I would also change them from the ones to the twos. <laughs> and then I uh, graduated that from that eventually uh, when a friend at um, at the venue that I enjoy going to the most made those for me. Um, he always, back in the day in HeroClix, uh, when people would play very meta things, especially in more casual venues, the term for it at that time was calling the, the team's cheese um mm -hmm. yeah and so he made me a set of custom tokens out of like sculpey uh that he had hardened and painted that looked like little blocks of cheese and little wedges of cheese and over time i slowly lost many of them and then had to make more myself because uh, that just became my favorite set and i mean when i have time to plan ahead that i'm going to be going to play Euroclix, that is the set that i like to bring with me as my action tokens just these little cheese wedges and cheese wheels that are made out of sculpey and not as edible as they look wow i am my jaw is like hitting the floor i was completely not prepared for that answer 
of sculpted cheese being, <laughs> being an actor. <laughs> that is awesome. That is hilarious. Uh, I do I do miss those days. We played, I think last year, a Golden Age game, and I played like Hammer Thor Captain America and Ben Crawler. I called it my finely aged. I love that. It's so funny. Oh my gosh. It might be the, my new favorite answer now to any anyone's first action tokens or favorite action tokens because that's that's beautiful yeah nowadays since that term isn't really thrown around in the community anymore i just say i use those because all of my jokes are cheesy ah there you go ah, a nice pivot i did never understand the term cheese though like why cheese yeah do you I, know the origins of that i do not know i just latched onto it like everybody else and enjoyed it sure that was the perfect segue to a cheesy joke, though. Do you know the origins? We'll see. It starts the cow. Good. Ah. Uh, no, yeah. No, no, you don't. Don't pity. Don't pity my laugh at me. Uh, <laughs> well, you would know. You know, I would respect your opinion on well, that if I you went that route. Dairy, not not a dairy farm. But there is. We don't make cheese. Can't. We're not from Wisconsin. We don't do that. We don't do that here. Purely <sighs> beef. Sadly, we're all beef. There's no, there's no cool beef thing except if you got beef with someone, that'd be about it. Um, you can't have beef with Matty G. It's just true. Uh, anyways, do you have a favorite team you saw this year at Worlds, Anthony? Like a favorite team build or uh, just anything that was like fun, something unique, or something where it's like I just really like the way that team works right now in modern. Uh so overall, I definitely did enjoy Isaac's team with the X Men swap that was going around. Um, I thought it was really neat to get to see Cake Deadpool coming out. Um, I know my friend Jay Solomon was very excited to get to see Hope Summers being played. Um, overall, though, just my favorite thing that I was getting to see all weekend long were people playing on the Barnstable Smith wedding map. And uh, every yes. time on that map, I took a photo. It's awesome. Do you, uh, do you remember when like you knew that map was going to be made? Like, yeah. What was your reaction uh, to that? Yeah, it was probably like a month or maybe two months before my wedding was coming up. Uh, so this would have been like the start of 2022. Um, Adam had Adam Friedman had previously won uh, national or he had won whatever the big event was in 2021. If it was nationals or worlds, I think it was nationals the whiz kids was doing and so uh it uh the roc was letting him design one of the roc maps and he didn't really have a good plan in mind for what he was going to do with it and i was talking to him about um the wedding at the time because he was my best man at my wedding um he is my best friend and so that's why i wanted him to be in that role for it and he had suggested, you know, uh, how would you feel if I did your wedding venue as the map? Do you think you'd be able to help me get pictures to make that happen? And I was so flattered and appreciative of that and absolutely started to help him out with that and started getting him the reference photos he needed. And then he talked and got approval to wait until he was actually there at the wedding and uh, we were able to take a bunch of photos in the the venue itself, all set up and everything. Uh, and then he submitted them that weekend. And the, however that whole process works, they went ahead and took the photos and made a really great representation um, that was really, really close. Um, I think they just moved like one or two minor things um, but it was really close to what it actually looked like, and I was really happy about it, and really grateful to him for that. that is awesome. That is such a cool story. What does what does your wife think about the map? Is she a big fan? She's like, that's so cool. So yeah, since it's come out, uh, we have a copy, and she thought that was absolutely amazing to see in person. And after I shared with her. Um, the photos of different people playing on it and seeing it be used this weekend. She was really excited to get to see that and uh, is really hopeful that next year she might get to come out and see it in person if it's still legal then and uh, get to maybe talk to one or two of the people playing it. Um, and yeah, she was 
she overall really likes the idea of that happening. Awesome. Yeah, it's a pretty oh. good reminder or like memento of the occasion. Um, I say as somebody who is more interested in hero clicks than marriage, but <laughs> I would assume it's a pretty cool reminder because I don't know, it just seems pretty special. And then it also like captures like, you know, the venue and everything. But yeah, I did, I did see quite a few people playing on it. Um, I don't own one myself, but like after looking at it, I was like, yeah, I can see why it makes sense to like put this on a team. Yeah. I'm definitely hopeful that it can end up in the hands of more players and more people can, uh, kind of share in that special memory with us we want to do one last call for questions here while we still have anthony and then move on to bad sam guys that sounds good i think we uh we skipped over it's a bit of a generic question but with you being like an older legacy player what is a legacy card that you would want to see made wow for one that is so weird to think of myself as an older legacy player because to me, I think of all of the rest of the guys um, that I can think of in the community as like, no, those are the OGs. Those are the older legacy players. I am not lucky enough to count myself among them, but I guess you're right. Cause I mean, at 17 years, that's been a long time. Um, in terms of a legacy card though, that I would love to see. Wow. That is a tough choice. Cause there are so many great characters that I would love to see come back with a legacy card. Um, definitely my favorite figure of all time, Avengers set Patriot. So I would always love to see a legacy card for him. Um, I think that would be a challenging one to put together and an interesting one to put together to try and make him worthwhile and enjoyable to more people. Um, besides that one, um, in terms of DC, I think I would enjoy seeing Gene Grafted Brain get a legacy card. He was oh, a uh, Yeah, I don't even remember that one. Uh, oh, Brain. oh my gosh, it is a thing. Okay, I have <laughs> I've never heard of this figure before. Yeah, it was Collateral Damage LE. Uh, it was from a storyline where uh, the Brain from the Brotherhood of Evil, sworn nemeses of um, the Doom Patrol, uh, he came up with a technology to steal all of the best powers from the Justice League. And he mm. took his uh, vocal box. He took the Flash's legs, uh, Kyle Rayner's whole arm that has the ring on it. rather than <laughs> <laughs> uh, Very Frankenstein-esque. Yeah, Martian Manhunter's eyes, because I guess if you can only steal one thing from an alien with a billion powers, you go for his eyes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, then he was just running around as this super powerful uh, villain and all the Justice League had to struggle with trying to continue to be heroes, losing the thing that defines them. Interesting. I mean, no, I do remember I that there was a there was like the REV of that figure. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, the veteran was like the uh, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher his name. The Majir Mala, the the ape, right? Yeah, with so, brain on the sculpt as well. It was kind of like the first uh, duo figure in a way. Yeah, it was the rookie started off as uh, Monster Mala by himself, and then the experience was the brain by himself, and then the veteran was Monster Mala with the brain, and then the LE was the gene grafted brain. Wow, what an was, interesting REV! I had never connected the dots on that LE. All these figures, and I'm like, wow, what in the world? This is wild. Well, that is an excellent pick. I love that. I would love to see that as well. Or just an updated version, really. Like, let's see what that figure looks like. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that would be a fun choice. Okay. Wow, Gene Graft Brain. And that's like just a cool story that I need to, like, out now. Because that's just, huh? Thing. You know, what did I he guess... take from Batman, actually? Last question on that. Waste. His belt. He took the Flash's <laughs> legs. His actual Batman waist. tips. His actual yeah, he took waist. his waist. There we go. His bank account, if I remember correctly. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> Took a credit card swipe in hand. That was his other arm, was the Batman arm. Of course, uh, of course. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, I forgot the question I was going to ask. Something about Batman, maybe? I don't think it was. I don't think it was Batman. It was uh, something weird along the lines of. Oh, that, that's what it was. The comic book story being a very interesting thing that I'd never heard of before there ever hero clicks that were coming out where you were like, I have no idea 
this is about. I have to go read this comic series. Like, do you have a favorite comic series or event that was represented in Heroclix? So, in general, um, I started playing the game before I ever read any comics, and I still haven't read that many comics overall. Um, most of the storyline organized plays, I did not read the comics that were originally associated with them. And for a lot of them, I then went back and said, you know, this is a good excuse. Let's go read that comic. Let's find out, um, kind of how all this played out. And I think I enjoyed no man's land the most in terms of ones that I went back and read, um, discovering that fear itself was the biggest disappointment to read. Oh. I think- Oh, those are fighting words here. That's <laughs> wow. No, keep going. You've cut me so deep right now, Mr. Burnstable. Oh, my favorite part was the ad at the back of one of those comics that had um I could buy the upcoming Hulk Tober comics. And I was like, okay, that sounds fantastic. That sounds way better than what I'm reading right now. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm man. glad you like No Man's Land though. I love yeah. No Man's Land. I'm I'm actually just speechless. So if yourself is my favorite Marvel <laughs> event, uh, this has cut me core to the bone. I will. Uh, wow. itself would have been a really good video game. I would play that as a video game, but as a book, I had to read. Sorry. Ah, uh, please! I can only cry so much. Tearing <laughs> <laughs> me apart, Anthony. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's all good. I I will have a hard time sleeping will not will not lie uh all right let's if we've uh wrapped questions on that incredible note play some bad samaritan because i am excited to be bad sam with likely to get more patrons now strange but it doesn't take an expert will require Ian being a random number generator, 1 through 20. Of and course, of course. The folks playing at home who we haven't done Bad Samaritan in a minute, the rules for Bad Samaritan are fairly simple. Uh, Ian, Anthony, and Simeon are going to semi-work together, but if they guess it correctly, only that single person gets a point. Um, to guess the Heroclix figure that I have chosen, they get three rounds of clues... At each round, they get a guess, so they'll get a random clue, 1 through 20, and I will tell them that about the figure, then they'll guess based off that clue. They don't get it, we move on to round 2, round 3, etc. However, if you do get it right in the earlier rounds, you will get more points, so there is an incentive to try to get a good guess right away out there. I will be choosing three figures from Modern Age, and one figure from Golden Age. It is specifically not modern, but it can be literally anything anywhere else throughout all of time that a hero crux has made not a horror crux i suppose or a horror crux if that was another uh worry it will neither be those things uh but this is this is the incredibly fun game of bad samaritan named after you guessed it uh, the rare bad samaritan because it's something named after him i guess but yeah i'll be i'll be tracking points here for all uh a b s b and then i e now, are these mission points? Uh, mm, they are not mission Ooh. points. Because actually, uh, less than 20 will do something. Okay. And so, yes. Don't worry. You don't have to get 20 to win the game. I don't even know. Uh, let's <laughs> see. Uh, three, three. You can't even get 20 points. <laughs> Perfect. But these ones, uh, the first three figures will all be modern. So, as a reminder, that is from the Fantastic Four set. Uh, up until the X Men of Swords, I'm not still not using the P kit um, X of Swords, so we know. Okay. No, no worries there. But, uh, yeah, if everybody's ready, first clue. The first clue is three. Uh, so three is going to be the set this character is from. This character is from. The X Men X of Swords set in the mind for everyone. I will guess Magneto. Yes, for Magneto. Hmm. I'm taking Summoner. He's been my most favorite piece to play from that so far. And one for Summoner. Ah, uh, it could be Wolverine. What we're going with Wolverine. All right, it is going to be. Got a set. 
none of those figures. <laughs> so we'll have to move on to round two here. Clue the second number. clue number is 12. Was any special combat symbols? This is, a, this is always a rough one. This character has no special combat symbols. It has boot, fist, shield, inter- indomitable, and then burst. Mm. It doesn't fly. Not big. <clears throat> and it's not a sharpshooter. Oh boy. So yeah, good. Not duo attack. Okay. Not a fish either, yeah. Uh, I'll take Pyro. Okay, Pyro. I'm going to take uh, Solemn. Okay. White Priestess. Ooh. Is gonna be none of those figures. We are in the final round. I hope I'm now gonna add myself to potential points because every figure you guys don't get right, I do get a point for. So, okay. Shall see. Well, your last clue number is twenty. Uh, so twenty is uh, two random free clues. So you to spin it again. Ooh, eleven. Uh, so 11 is going to be a name of a trait. Uh, so roll it again, and I'll give them to you both the same. And the next one is 14. Okay, 11 and 14. 14 is opening attack power. So uh, the name of this character's trait, I'm sure you're excited, is Sword Bearer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And this character's opening attack power is penetrating Psychic Blast. Oh, um, Cable. I'll go with Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Oh wait, that's the super rare I'm thinking of. Uh, dang, I don't know if the main set one has penetrating psychic blast. Um, man, who are our big pen side guys in that set? That are also sword bearers. That are also sword bearers. Yeah, it. I'm, very I'm well pretty done. pretty positive it's cable. Yeah, it might just be cable. Um, I can't even think of anyone else with psychic blast now that I'm sitting here. I'll I'll stick with the apocalypse. He might have psychic blast. I don't remember. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember if Cyclops starts with psychic blast or if he gets it later on. Well, I'm gonna go hopeful and pick Cyclops. Okay. Uh, sadly, yes, it is Cable. <laughs> right off the bat, he Ooh. scored that one. I will say there is a theme this week in Bad Sam. Teams in Bad Sam have traditionally been all over the place, whether they represent a state or country. Uh, all the characters have maybe a sword or are leaping or flying, something random. If you do guess theme, you do get a whopping 10 points, uh, but that is only because the themes are so incredibly out there um, sometimes, or sometimes they aren't. But this is your first hint. I guess it's a theme. And the first character was Cable. So we can move on to character number two with a point going to Ian. Awesome. All right. The first clue is going to be 13. 13 is opening movement power. This character has opening shots. Opening speed power. This is their top line. All the all the clues are going to be for their highest point value top starting click. This character has running shot. Um... Let's lock in Hobgoblin. Okay. I'm going to go with Hawkeye. Oh, wait. No, that's a special speed power. Dang. I'm not going to go with Hawkeye. I'm going to go with uh, Iron Man because he's sometimes got that. Cable. Ooh. Uh, I typically do not choose the same figure, although there is also a, another version that could be chosen, so I, I will allow it. Uh, it is none of those, however... <laughs> I thought I had him with the Hobgoblin. I really did. I thought I figured yeah. out. <laughs> I was... You were thinking I was being very tricky. All right. The second clue for this figure is six. Six is going to be a named keyword. This character is an Avenger. Hmm. Oh. Uh, Avenger. I'll go with Thor, because there's a bunch of them. Uh, Captain Marvel, maybe. Yeah, we'll, I'll take I'll take Captain Marvel. I'm pretty sure there's one with a uh, running shot in yeah. War of the Realms. Uh Moon Knight, right? Captain Marvel, Thor, and Moon Knight. 
Anthony, taking home the point here, it is Moon Knight from oh. War, of War of the Realms Moon Knight. Yes, this is the War of the Realms Moon Knight. Got it. So yeah, what a guy. Did not he did not make it all the way to, to round three. So you got that second clue point. Going ahead in the lead there. Third figure is modern. Gotcha. The first clue for that one is nine. Nine is gonna be top dial stats and team ability. Oh boy, that's a lot of information. This character is a 10, 11, 18, 3. Team ability they have is Fantastic 4. Oh. 10, 11, 18, 3. Human Torch? Okay, Maybe. Human torch? Oh. I think Human Torch. 10, 11, 18, 3. I'll go with the thing. Um, I'll go with a Spider-Man. All right. The out of nowhere Spider-Man pick. It. I like it. It is going to be none of those, however. So we do have to move on to round number two, but we are whittling down the members of the Fantastic Four. These people okay. with the team building. So the next clue is five. I'm just going to be, oh, uh, this is rough. Rarity and set number. Uh, you don't get to know set just yet, but you do get another rarity and set number. This rarity, this figure is a common, and it is set number 012. Zero twelve. <laughs> of what set? Who knows? You have two entire zero twelve figures. You zero twelve, ten, eleven, eighteen, three. Uh, jeez. Um, I'm trying to think of like commons from either of those sets, like Future Foundations or this one or uh, Fantastic Four. Like, obviously. I mean, so people could have the Fantastic Four team ability. You that is true. Empire. Empire was a set. Oh yeah, Empire and, too. Yeah, and I'm trying to help you guys. But I'm just saying, like you know, was there? I think there was like a common She-Hulk. I could see her having that stat line, so I'll take She-Hulk. Okay, taking She-Hulk. I'm gonna go with Black Panther. Right. I'm gonna keep the theme of uh, ladies here, and I'm gonna go She Thing. Ooh, right. So we She Thing. We have Black Panther. We have She-Hulk. It is gonna be. Anthony, coming in with the the win here, uh, well, the win in modern age anyways, we were not totally decided yet, but it is She-Thing. Uh, old Aaron Ventura here of Unlimited Class Wrestling fame. Yeah. I do not even remember that figure being I, I off. Was that it, was, it was a toss-up because there it could have been a Miss Thing as well, so he, he got it right. It is uh, She-Thing. Yeah. Oh, of course, of course. There's another two points, though, because that was made in the second round. All right, we go to Golden Age. Uh, everybody still has a shot at winning it, even though Anthony's got a, a good lead. Golden Age, the points are doubled, and the random number generator is, I believe, 1 through 10. Gotcha. All so right. Points are doubled, so the if you get it right on the first round, you get six points. Second, you get three. The last, you get two. So Ian, to tie Anthony, needs to get it right at the very least the second round. And then Simeon to win <laughs> needs to get it right on the very first round. I believe, I believe... Anthony's got your number. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the first clue is nine. And and again, there is a theme. If that helps anyone, nine uh, nine is a free play uh, for the Golden Age Bat Sam. So. Here are, I'm going to just read off all of them for you. So you have named and generic keyword, opening powers and stats, text and name of a special power, the text and name of a trait, uh, the information on the back of the card. So if it's a really old Golden Age figure, I'll tell you the weird wiki thing they used to have on them. Uh, the set, rarity, and number. HC Realms comment by someone talking about this figure. Uh, and then... This character's combat symbols, range, and point value. Lots of information for Golden Age to help you really narrow it down. Hmm. I like the set rarity and number. I think that one could be really helpful. Where yeah. are you guys standing? I think that'll definitely narrow it, to whether it's like indie, Marvel, whatever. I will also remind everyone that HC Realm's comment is just me. Yeah. <laughs> but if we don't want to, I also understand because this is a game we're trying to win and get points. Because I think he might narrow it down a lot by telling us this figure would be way better if it had a hammer or an infinity gauntlet. <laughs> oh, true, true. Or welcome to the army of <laughs> happened to be alive. Doug's army. Welcome to Doug's army. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, well, Anthony, you are the guest, so you can uh, pick the option. Okay, I, I need to know that AC Realms comment. It's oh, so Let's go. So I will read you the names of all the commenters <laughs> on this figure, and you guys get to choose whose comments we want to read here. Uh, so going from oldest to newest, we have the GD Batman, Paint of Hearts, O Cory Go Go, Combat Boy, uh, Go Cory Go Go again, uh, Psycho Civic, Ped Kid 86, Jackson 123, Warmer 80, Some Dizzle 88, and Would You Kindly 66. Hmm. I'm partial to Moped Kid. I was going to say, do any of these old names ring any bells, Anthony? Because none of them sound familiar to me. Moped Kid sounds familiar to me. Um, other than that, the one name that showed up twice sounded familiar the second time I heard it because I heard it once before. <laughs> <laughs> Are we um, are we saying uh, old moped kid here? I think I, we're gonna. I think so. Yeah. I think we're locking in moped kid. Okay. This is this gonna be fun. So this was. Uh, I won't tell you the date, and I will also tell you my personal favorite comments uh, later. So he says, slightly disgusted that WK would make such a cool figure a case incentive marquee. They ship one with each case of KA2, which makes the figure itself a little too hard to get for a marquee. It's a very cool figure, to be sure, but WizKids, or sorry, excuse me, WK, irked me and many others by making him so much harder to get than any other marquee figure. Thanks, WK. I got my answer. All right. Colonel Stars and Stripes? Hold on now. Wow, okay. All right, Simeon. All right, Simeon. Is that also your answer, Anthony? Well, it was going to be, but now <laughs> you that can one take it. Hour we, we to split the points, and was also part of that. I'm gonna go the the hard play on this, and it might be Eisenhower. Okay, all right. <sighs> Marquee figure Eisenhower, and then one for Colonel Stars and Stripes. Oh gosh, hard to get marquee figure. I honestly have nothing. I don't know why, but my Mind is floating to Super Scroll Illuminati, who is a brick figure. <laughs> but that's what I'll lock in because I, I have no clue. You guys seem like you have it figured out. It is going to be this Colonel Stars and Stripes. Yes. So the, the K and set A2. number A2 yeah. easily yeah, really gave that away. Set and set number would have also given it away because I'm sure he's the only one with. Uh, Ass set number LE two hundred, uh, but it was also like an instant away. Um, trait would have also done him in with the trait called Eisenhower, and then I assume uh, I will really quickly shout out. Thank you kindly sixty six, the only playable figure in this entire set, which is straight up not true. I loved the chase, uh, Dave Lazuski. He was great, um, but yeah. So now that you know all the figures. What do you think the theme is? We have a she thing cable, Moon Knight, and Colonel Stars and Stripes. This is for a and now although Simeon's got a whopping six points, this is for a whopping ten points. Make anyone win and get it right, but they only get one shot at guessing the theme. Oh gosh. <sighs> cable, Moon Knight, She Thing, Colonel Stars and Stripes. So we got Moon, we got Stars. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, is it like mental health problems maybe like cables all screwed up from time travel you know moon knight's got his whole thing going on uh colonel stars and stripes you know based on the movie he was he was i guess he was he wasn't all there yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna lock in with like mental health issues (laughs) okay that's my okay (laughs) um i'll save saying who's right and wrong until we've all made guesses are these all George Strait songs? Is that your? Uh, is that gonna be your locked in guess? No, I I just can't. It would be. It's not out of the realm of possibility for me, I suppose. So I do remember she thing sometimes wore a suit for her powers, and Cable, he's holding a giant big sword. He also often has guns that do a lot for him. Moon Knight is predominantly a gadgets guy, and Stars and Stripes was. I mean, a guy with a club and a dog. So I think it's a theme of people using technology for their work. Okay. That's what I'm locking in. 
right? Locking in technology use people. Gadget gadget superheroes. I'm gonna since Anthony's on the podcast, I'm gonna say that your theme was characters that you think are judgy. Mm. <laughs> I will say part of me did want to do a uh, so that's Simeon locked in. Those are all wrong. Uh, so Simeon is this week's winner for Bad Samaritan. Good job. I did want to uh, do a like Ash Dread, uh, some other ones where the theme was going to be like Anthony Barnstable. Um, <laughs> I thought that would have been really funny. Uh, no, the theme this week, and I don't know why I chose this, but it's Jim Carrey. Uh, all of these figures represent a role Jim Carrey's had in a movie, Colonel Stars and Stripes being straight up Jim Carrey. Uh, Moon Knight from me, myself, and Irene, uh, the multiple personality uh, thing going on there. Cable from, you guessed it, the Cable, uh, the guy. cable guy. Uh, uh, she thing might have been a bit of a pull, but her real name is Sharon Ventura. I like Ace Ventura. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, these are These are all... Uh, Jim Carrey. So, listener was like, Calder was right. The themes don't make that much sense, and they are kind of wild. And, and it it was. It was a weird one. So, when when Cable was the first figure, I was, instantly was thinking, like, literal Cable. Like, Cable TV. And I was going mm. with that, but I did not make the leap to Cable Guy at any point. Yeah, like, oh, I had nothing. Not bad. not bad, though. Good showing. Good job, Simeon. You get six whole bad Sam points oh, that boy. go to go to you and we'll we'll keep track at the end of the year oh but anthony made a strong showing with the big four like that i like it right ladies and gentlemen that is the podcast anthony thank you so much for coming on we've all had a blast getting to just rack your brain uh, and ask you all these fun questions and it's a talk and especially play some bad sam if you want to feel free to shout out any player any venue uh, anything you want to is yours so my favorite venue I've ever played at is one that's still running uh, events regularly. Games Plus in Mount Prospect, Illinois is a fantastic place to play. Very, very casual venue. Um, definitely, you have to go into it with a mindset of planning to have fun and have time. Uh, no desire to win at all uh, if you want to have a good time and enjoy your time there. And I definitely recommend anybody who's looking for just some good, fun hero clicks. It's a great place to check out and play at. Um, definitely one of my favorite play- players to play against uh, goes there pretty regularly. Andrew Prost is hilarious to play a game against. He fills the game with tons of jokes and laughter and a good time. Uh, that would definitely be where I'd like to shout out and remind them that I am so grateful for them as a venue that I've gotten to attend over the years. That's awesome. That is any kind of venue I would love to go to. It sounds awesome. Yeah. Right. Ian, a quick shout out. You're not always on the show, so we'll also give you a shout out. Oh, I get a shout out? Awesome. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I guess my shout out this week will be to Dragon's Den for letting me play in their slop event. That was a great time. I ended up walking away with a mojo, so thank you to those guys. That they were very rough nice. Shout out. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> rough shout I out. They were very it. nice. That's good, though. That's good. And I also walked away with a rare Wolverine. So that was really cool, too. That was my top want from the set. So couldn't have gone any better. All right, Simeon. Read us out of here, my man. All right. And with all of that, Dial H for Hero Clicks is brought to you in part by CoolStuffInc.com, where you can still sell Hero Clicks to. Imagine. A website where you can buy and sell hero clicks? Amazing. Glad that they're the ones doing that still. So, uh, yeah, check them out at coolstuffinc.com. All right, guys. Betrayals. So, if you're looking for emotional satisfaction, my advice to you is seek professional hero clicks. No. Are you serious? Again? How many people even play this game? Like a hundred? Instant deadpan humor. Over How they, six uh, people humor? think I am funny. It's a hard day's work. Not that you know anything about that. Which you absolute fools? It's not Witcher nonsense. I'm gonna make hero clips like that forever. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey Google, attack someone. Let's attack Simeon because he's a jerk. Epic trails. 